Now, we know there's all sorts of reasons that people go into politics and they're probably not completely honest with us about what really motivates them much of the time, but we've got to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that a lot of people go into politics because they want to do things for people, to make the world better for people. So it's kind of weird, isn't it, that politicians like Andrew Lamming and the Liberal Party get into trouble shouting on Facebook at constituents and they're ordered to do empathy training. What on earth is empathy training? We're about to find out. Let's catch up with Catherine Tay, who actually delivers empathy training. Thanks for joining us, Catherine. How could you teach me to Thanks have very much. empathy for others? I heard you've got a great heart. So well, I uh, do it all starts already, there, but it? if I didn't, how could you teach it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think there's. A, the self-awareness um, about how you're feeling and why you're feeling the way you do and why others feel the way they do. Um, that's sort of the start, really. Um, that's really important in order to be able to then work out how you can solve problems from their point of view. Well, it's fascinating you would start off with self-awareness because I would have thought that was the opposite. I would have thought if people don't have empathy, it's because they've got too much self-awareness and not enough awareness about what others are thinking. Well, I guess it's about the, you know, you're making the assumption there that self-awareness means self-focus. And I think um, in this context, self-awareness is about understanding the effect that you're having, the feelings that you have. So if you're really agitated and reactive or really angry or uptight, the effect that you're going to have on the person that is trying to tell you about a concern they have is going to be quite different than if you're feeling calm and comfortable and curious and engaged and interested in what they have to say to you. Yeah, that's a very interesting point because if you're feeling tense uh, or distracted, then you'll often appear to be dismissive to people who might be seeking your attention, right? Yeah, I mean, one of the first things that we do is this listening training and self-focused listening is the first level. It's where people are literally listening to what someone says in order to pivot to something that's important to them about themselves. Uh, you remember that old um, Bette Midler line, I'm, you know, I'm sick of you talking about uh, me, I, what do you think of me? You know, that, that <laughs> yeah. uh, really got a huge laugh, didn't it? Because there are, we all know people like that. And, you know, when talking to them, you never really feel like they understand you or engage with you. And, of course, um, that means you, means you just feel less connected to them. Now, some people are really gifted at this. I had the pleasure of working for a long while in relatively close contact now and then with John Howard when he was Prime Minister. And I saw him in situations where he was considering very, very difficult issues in a National Security Committee of Cabinet and the like then would have to go to another meeting mm. that might be a bunch of school kids. And for that moment, he would shut out everything else and give those school children his undivided attention. And I saw that in Bill Clinton too. People always say that with Clinton, that you're always mm. the most important person mm. is the one in front of him. And I saw mm. it. So uh, th there's a natural ability to actually shut out other concerns or other worries and focus on the person you're mm. speaking with, isn't there? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's presentism, you know, being able to really be present. It's not about the baggage of what's happened and the past that holds you back or, you know, your concerns about the future. It's genuinely thinking, actually, the most per important person right now is the person I'm talking to and I want to know and understand what they're thinking, what they're feeling, why. And when you can really engage with somebody like that because you're not holding on to your own emotional baggage, then um, you're absolutely more able to engage with them. Um, so actually, John Howard, when he was Prime Minister, is a great example. I use that stem cell um, example of, as an example of uh, just how well you can do institutional empathy. And um, he did that in the case of stem cells, where he actually acknowledged all the different perspectives and then allowed us to come to a conclusion as a nation. Yeah, you, well, you don't lose any brownie points uh, praising John Howard uh, in my company. He sort of set the, set the high bar when it came to politicians, I think. But if you've, you're presented with a politician who's a, a self-important uh, person who lacks empathy, are you really dealing... Is it counselling them you're dealing with? Is it sort of uh, uh, psychotherapy to try and... Uh, or are you just actually teaching them a skill? Well, I... I'm 
Yeah, I, I, a couple of things. One, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not trying to do individual psychotherapy. Um, what I am is someone who does engagement and communications in really hard conflict situations where people are angry with each other. So polarised situations, angry activists or angry community members or angry company people or angry governments, all of those things, high conflict situations is my specialty. And um, so I'm teaching them about what it might feel like going into that and how you can deal with that because it's, like I said, about how you might feel as well, because if you're apprehensive going into it, defensive going into it, you're going to create that situation. Um, and then it's how the other person might feel and how you can try to make sure they feel as empowered, as capable of engaging effectively in that situation as possible. It's fascinating stuff, Catherine. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it.